Hello and welcome to the Homeless Consultant channel. My name is Paul B. I am the Homeless Consultant. And today I'm going to uh, do a video I've wanted to do for quite some time, for almost a year now. Um, and that is to present you with a list of films, movies, that have at least some component to them that help to explain how and why our world and particularly our nation has gone down the toilet of insanity and it the, the reason I can do this is with films that have existed for almost a hundred years in some cases is because it didn't happen in 2020 it didn't start in 2020 it has been going on for decades and decades and decades that's one reason why I, for my entire adult life, for the last three decades, have been warning about this in every medium that has existed at the time. You know, going back when I was younger to trying to publish in newspapers, to Usenet groups on the internet, writing books that I try to get published, but nobody would listen. Nobody would listen. In 2020, people, it's not that they started listening, it's that they didn't have a choice anymore because the bat guano pe crazy people who want to take over everything came up and started shouting in everyone's ears in ways that you just couldn't miss. Even if you're trying your level best to avoid looking at reality. But film... See, when I was growing up, in school we were taught great literature. So we were taught Homer the Odyssey and the Iliad. We were taught Shakespeare, Milton, uh, Mark Twain, Edgar Allan Poe, um, fantastic books, The Scarlet Letter, uh, The Good Earth, you know, Pearl S. Buck, uh, Steinbeck, Hemingway, all these, what, what's considered great literature, even going back again with Virgil. Um, the reason it was called great literature and the reason it had been taught for hundreds and you know, for thousands of years in some cases, is because these, the writers of these works very effectively communicated the human experience to other people. So much of what we go through in our lives and what we think and what we feel, we, we sit there and we feel isolated and we feel like I'm the only person who feels this way. And great literature especially when taught to young people, help to bring them into the society of humanity. Because it showed, hey, this author from way back in ancient Greece, or this author from the, you know, back in the um, you know, 1600s or whatever, they understood. They're speaking my language. They're saying what I've been thinking and feeling, and I'm too scared to say out loud. And great literature brought us together in that manner. It, it let us know we weren't alone in these thoughts and feelings that we had and our interpretation of the world. It helped to create a real consistency for society and literature is one of the reasons why society kind of after all these empires that rose and fell in ancient times kind of coalesced into something a little bit more stable with several civilizations that then could start progressing and advancing and that's when we got better mathematics, better science, better technology uh, more longevity in life and things like that. So literature was a huge player in that. And when I was growing up, we were taught this literature. Now today, if I go out and I talk to a young person who attends a Minnesota public school, I'll be lucky if they've ever heard the name William Shakespeare. One thing they're not going to do is say, Oh yeah, Paul, I, I know Shakespeare of Friends, Romans, Countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often teared with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault. And grievously has Caesar answered it. There's not a Minnesota student who's going to say that. There's not a Minnesota student who even understands half the words that I just spoke from Shakespeare, including words like the and is. That's how bad our schools have become.
You see, the one reason the world has gone down this toilet of insanity is because the leftists who are taking over are crazy. They're nuts, if you haven't figured that out yet. People are starting to figure it out. I've been warning about it for 30 years. They're so crazy that they were more than happy to take that beautiful literature away from our civilization, which is to take a founding cornerstone away from our civilization, which is why we are now more uncivilized than our species has been for many, many centuries. Today, in the year 2021, and from last year to this year, the jump in the downgrade of our civilization from civilized humanity toward the animal world has been such a massive jump. It's like several hundred years back, you know, from the Middle Ages to the Dark Ages. Literature had that power and that impact on society. That's why I was taught it when I was young, as were my ancestors, as were our founding fathers of the United States of America. Kids today are raised with new medium. The lunatic left that took over our education system got rid of the great literature, and instead they're trying to be fair by going out and finding someone in Africa who wrote a book, which, which is great. I'm sure there's some awesome writers in Africa. Probably means a lot to Africans, but we're not. We're Americans. That's why things like the Grapes of Wrath have meaning to Americans that have no meaning to Africans. You know, because that covers events that happened here in the United States. The Scarlet Letter. That's something in American history, not in Gambian history, you see. But these lunatic leftists, they're going around the world looking for a Hindu writer and this writer and that writer. They're not really concerned with whether what's being written is very good. And even if it was good, it doesn't have any relevance to Americans. If you want to study Hindu literature, then go for it. Go for it. But in terms of general, you know, liberal education, public education, you don't dump Edgar Allan Poe so that we can read something written by somebody in Ethiopia 40 years ago. There's no point to that. So the kids today have absolutely no basis for understanding history and civilization and putting humanity into any kind of context anymore. Their main influence in terms of media is not great literature. It is, at least it was, film. And of course, I experienced film growing up. Film was a big influence on me. Film has a magnificent way of very quickly getting across many of those same types of themes and um, things that literature can do for you. They help you understand, oh, somebody else feels this way. Somebody else understands the way I feel. Um, and they can do it much quicker than a book can. But there's a trade-off there because you're watching it from a distance. And if you're getting distracted, you know, say because your phone keeps going off or because there's people talking all around you or in the case of where I was living because there's people dropping refrigerators on the ceiling and slamming doors and screaming and sitting outside in cars a boom, 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 while you're trying to watch a film, then you're not going to get out of that film what you would get out of reading a book in a nice quiet place where you can focus and concentrate and you can close the book when you need to and just think about something profound you just read in there. But when I was growing up, you had the opportunity at least to look at film in that manner. And I'm very grateful that in my schooling, I had more than one teacher who would actually bring films into the classroom. And they were good films. In fact, a couple of them are on this list. Um, and they taught me, one of them was back in 8th uh, eighth, eighth grade. 8th grade. And um, what she exposed us to was magnificent. It's something I never forgot. And I learned back then, 8th grade, hey, film can do for us what books traditionally have done for humanity. They don't replace books, but they complement it. They provide a new form of medium that can do new things for you. Now, of course, when you look at film today, oh, I just want to throw up, just want to vomit. That's why the Oscars they just had had the lowest ratings ever. Because 
elegant, classic, you know, golden age of Hollywood is long gone, where you had civilized, dignified people who, oddly enough, represent the American dream. They came from nothing, and they moved all the way up to become these national and worldwide celebrities. You know, the Clark Gables and the Cary Grants and these people. They just, they would have otherwise been shoe salesmen and working at the Department of Motor Vehicles. I mean, they, in America, they had the opportunity to rise to that level. It wasn't like someone was just born like a king. is just born with a crown on their head. <laughs> feel sorry for their mother. And because they have that crown on their head, that's it. From then until the day they die, whether they die at 18 or 118, everybody's stuck with this person. Even if they're crazy. Even if they're really mean. Even if they're evil. In America, it was another way. People, the individual, we the people could rise as far as we wanted to go. For what it's worth. Certainly compared to the rest of history. So film had film had this ability to present us with the benefits that great literature did but in a different way that both went faster and also because it had that visual aspect it could really affect you in a different way than books can a film can make you cry or laugh bust out laughing very easily a book it's much more difficult to get to that point where you're gonna burst out in tears or burst out laughing um, so things are much accelerated in film. Hi, sorry for the interruption, but while editing this, I realized I left out a very important uh, note. I want to make the point that while film can be extraordinarily effective at communicating when it's an original story by a screenwriter or perhaps someone who just wrote a book but it really hasn't been read that much, um, when you make a film adaptation of classic great literature, you know, Homer or Milton or the Scarlet Letter or something like that. When you do that, you run the risk of ruining that literature for people who might prefer to read it. Um, for example, when you read, you form all kinds of mental images in your mind. What the people look like, what they sound like, what the aromas are like, what the, um, the way that people move, what their gait is like the environment, the buildings, the interior, exterior decorating, all of that you form with your imagination and it gives your imagination a really good workout. In film that's just all presented to you and it's almost impossible to unforget it. Uh, so for example uh, if someone watches the movie Achilles you know based on the Iliad they might you know, if they went to read the Iliad later, they might not be able to get the thought out of their head that Achilles looked like Brad Pitt with long hair. Um, likewise, uh, if you're watching The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, instead of reading the book, Marvin the Paranoid Android might always sound like Alan Rickman to you. And that's a shame. That's a terrible shame that film does that. So I'm not a fan of film adaptations of great literature. Um, just like I'm not a fan of doing remakes of films that were done extraordinarily well to begin with. Um, when you're watching a film adaptation, like I said, your imagination does not get the workout, doesn't get the exercise it does when you read. That's one of the benefits of reading. That's what helps, that's why reading helps to make you smarter and more competent. It helps to make you a better writer. Um, but when you're watching a film adaptation, the beautiful, the clever, creative, elegant, um, effective use of written language just it's completely lost because you're not reading you're watching a screen um, so you're not you're not getting the syntax the semantics the vocabulary the grammar that the original writer used and you know it's that's their craft they're in there pulling out these words and putting stringing them together in this order to have the most impact on you and in screenwriting is a completely different manner of writing it's just soundbite writing. You have to get things out there quickly for the most part. Um, again, it can be very effective with an original work, but when you're adapting a classic literature, it can really ruin it. Um, also, watching a film does not improve your reading comprehension skills, obviously. 
the way you learn how to read better and to comprehend what you're reading better is to read, not to watch a movie. Um, and if the film sucks, you run the risk that people will never read the book. They might think that the book is just as bad. And one reason for that is my last note here, because when there's a film adaptation of a great book, the people who get the credit for the work, the original work, tends to be the film director, the actors, you know, the screenwriters, the editors. They're the ones who get the credit. They're the ones you associate with it. You associate Brad Pitt with Achilles. You don't associate Homer. Um, and these are problems I have with film adaptations of classic literature. So, again, what I said in the beginning of this applies. Film does not replace great literature. It enhances it. It augments it. It's, it's a second tool that we benefit from in our generation. Anyway, just wanted to make that point. Back to the video. Throughout, since the beginning of film, you know, the, the first real film out there that you probably would think of as a real film, not just a little clip, would be Metropolis, which is not on my list. It, maybe it should be, but it's not. Uh, I do recommend that you watch Metropolis. But, um... Film, film, some filmmakers saw film as an opportunity like a good writer of fiction or poetry would. Uh, they saw their craft as an opportunity to really affect people, to help them think about the eternal questions, philosophical questions, um, to, help, to help, you know, all of us understand, again, the, the human condition that is common to us all. But there were also other specific things, such as, you know, if, um, like when, when Hitler rose to power, Charlie Chaplin made the film The Great Dictator. Well, that was meant to expose what Hitler was in an entertaining way. Excuse me. <laughs> to expose what Hitler was in an entertaining way. And film could be used to do that uh, quickly. So, throughout the history of film, filmmakers, screenwriters, actors, and editors, all kinds of people involved in the process have seen film as an opportunity to express or teach or inform of something while going about this entertainment as well that might be quite apart from the actual plot of the story. So, you might have a plot of a film that's it's a romantic love story okay and it goes on and on but there's little bits and pieces subplots going on out here that teach you something very important about the world we live in and in many cases the what they're teaching are warnings or teaching you how to identify something that will help improve your life if you pay attention but again most people don't pay attention young people today trying to watch a film I can't imagine being a young person trying to watch a film when you've got that little mini idiot box. When I was younger, you had the television set, the, the big boob tube, the idiot box. Now you've got the little pocket idiot box, the phone. And if you're going to watch a movie with that phone on and you're just worried about, you know, tweeting and going to Facebook and checking to see if you got a message all the time, you're not paying attention to the film. You're not going to learn anything. So what I'm asking you to do here is to watch these films, you know, pick the ones that you want to watch based on what I tell you about them, and watch them. Really watch them. Watch them in the manner that you would read great literature and interact with great literature. Get from these films what was put in there for your benefit. And you might be really surprised when you hear what I have to say about these films, how much was there all along, and you never noticed it. Now, with with 2020 being this watershed moment where so many people's eyes finally opened when they've been walking around you know like this deliberately for their whole lives you know don't talk to me Paul don't tell me anything about health fascism I don't want to hear about it, it doesn't exist I don't believe in it well now you don't have a choice do you because it ain't me talking about it it's just there literally in your face and the only way you're going to avoid it is if you decide consciously, I'm going to go insane and I'm going to deny the reality that my equals are forcing me at gunpoint to stick this underwear on my face when it serves zero scientific medical benefit. 
and it's dehumanizing beyond anything this nation really has seen since human slavery. So let me go over a few preliminaries before I start with the films themselves. Um, again, each of these films that I talk about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring out an aspect of the film that is meant to teach you something or inform you of something. Um, if you remember my, in 2019 I posted my video, The 50 Ex Greatest Existential Threats to America. And it wasn't all the existential threats I'm aware of. I left out China because it's an external threat. I was trying to focus on internal stuff more. Um, I never got to finish ex talking about them in detail, so I never really got to the part about voter fraud and all that, which is merged in with some other um, ones. But, you know, there were things like health fascism, um, the end of heroes, Young people today don't have the kind of heroes I had growing up. It, it's they have no role models for heroism, for virtue. Um, media manipulation: the way that the mass media has become nothing more than a manipulative tool of a relatively small group of certifiably insane people who don't even know what they want. They're trying to take over the whole world and dominate everyone's lives, and they don't even know exactly, really, what it is they're trying to do. They just want to be in control. So they keep saying, you know, well, it's for your own good. It's for your own good. Hmm. Um, the radical left. I think that was number 49 out of my 50. And they weren't in order of importance, by the way. Um, the radical, oh no, 48, I think. The radical left... Um, you can't let people who are insane take over your society. It isn't going to end well. But our generation did it. Our ancestors did not. My parents' generation did not. But this current generation did. They handed the greatest accomplishment in human history, the United States of America, they handed it over to an incredibly evil stupid and insane movement of people who are so dissociated from reality that they don't even have a common agenda to get behind except insanity such as a college professor saying that two plus two is five and the even worse insanity of the administrators of that school not firing a college professor who teaches young people that 2 plus 2 equals 5. You know why? Because he believes it equals 5. You try building an airplane that flies using that mathematics, folks. We are not in for a very good future. And it's because of this generation. Not me. I'm the one who's been warning my entire adult life. Just something to think about. I also need to put in a uh, disclaimer, a couple disclaimers here. First of all, one reason I've held off on this video is because as a Christian, these films, shall we say, are not Christian films. There's a lot of horrible, bad language in them. Um, admittedly, it can be very funny in a comedy, but <clears throat> it is very bad language. There's a lot of sex, there's a lot of drugs, there's there's all that bad stuff in these films. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the simple fact is, if you're watching those films over the course of your whole lifetime, you become desensitized to these things, and they seem to be normal. That's what normalizes these, these bad and destructive behaviors and thoughts and beliefs. So... It, only in that sense am I hesitant to even present you with these films or to ask you to watch them in such, num in such great numbers as these. But with that disclaimer, I think if I point out the reason I think you should watch these films and you focus on that reason, you know, you've seen enough of this bad stuff where it's probably, you know, I, I can't do anything about the degeneracy that you find in these films. Um, trying to shock people to get more viewers which is a method of just exploiting you. Um, second of all, and I think I'm going to need my glasses here to even know what I 
wrong. Let's see. Yeah, like I was saying before, you do. You're only going to get something out of these films if you turn off your phone and you watch the films and you watch them like you would watch read great literature. Think about what's in there carefully. When the film's done, sit down in, in quiet for a moment and just think about it. What did I just see? What does it mean? Ask yourself questions. Start pondering things. If you turn off the, the film and you go straight to a meal and you start just chatting about daily stuff with your friends and family, or you go out and play basketball, or you go straight to your phone, everything you just watched in that film pff, is gone. And you're not going to have the intensity and the immediacy later to ponder it the way you need to. When you're reading, uh, uh, my books are buried in here, but when you're reading a book, if you find something that's really profound, you usually kind of shut it, you know, keep your finger in there and you shut it and you just, hmm. And that's the beauty of great literature. You have to do that with these films if you're going to get out of it anything other than just mindless entertainment. Like I said, you might be surprised that a lot of this stuff was hidden in plain sight in these films all along. Um, and the last thing I would say is that I have to kind of give a spoiler alert. I'm not going to deliberately give out endings to films or something like that or critical information, but I may end up doing so. I don't know yet, but it depends on whether doing that, you know, moves us forward toward understanding the point that I want that I want you to watch the film for. So just be aware, I might spoil some of those films. It doesn't spoil the film, but it might spoil the ending or something. I'll do my best not to, though. And with that, let's just get started. Um, this is probably going to have to be broken up into two or three videos, because like I said, there's basically 59 of these, and then there's an honorable mention, so I don't know, 60, but something like that. We'll see what number I decide to call it on the in the description for this video. 